Well, good morning. Hey, that wasn't too bad. All right. Maybe you're ready to roll. Amen. Hey, if you're a first time guest, uh, reiterate what Nathan said. Um, uh, thank you. It's an honor to have you with us today. Fill out that welcome card. We have a gift for you out at the Connect Center. Um, and as again, if if you're with us every week, we do not take that for granted. We are so glad you're here, and uh, we just are thankful for you and for your faithfulness. One little thing on the app that, um, if I'm wrong, Nathan can correct me, um, but um, he won't do it publicly because I'm the boss. Um, <laughs> I just tease it. Um, we, we, you know, things come into my head, and they just come out my mouth. I don't know. Um, but uh, in all seriousness... When you click that register and you put in your, your uh, email that the church already has and your phone number and you log in, sometimes it will give an error message. And if you close the app and reopen it and put that email and password in again, it will usually then let you in. So I don't know why I'm not uh, an app creator or tech savvy enough to tell you why. I can just tell you that if it gives you that error, close the app open it back up, put your information in, and it frequently uh, will, will work at that point. Am I correct? Thank you. I got the nod yes. All right. So um, that's good. So if you're having that issue, um, just kind of close that, open it back up. should be good. Also want to encourage you, Red Letter Challenge will be starting in September. Man, I'm excited about that. Our, our, our leaders have kind of been going through it just to get a feel for it and, and to kind of create a little content that we can can push out to you guys during those 40 days. And we're going to be studying for 40 days the red letters of, uh, in the Bible, which is the words that what Jesus said, right? And if Jesus said them, they're probably important. And so we're going to be talking about those on Sundays, our small groups, our youth, our kids. Everybody's going to be going through that. And so I want to encourage you to be a part of that. Again, don't go buy the Red Letter Challenge book. We have a bunch of them. We have enough for every... Uh, uh, family, and if we feel like we're going to be running a little close, we'll order some more. But want to encourage you. Uh, let's do this thing together. And and uh, there are challenges every day. And and when we do it, commit to doing it. Follow through with it. God will transform some things in your life. I promise. We're going to continue today. I'm um, talking about the Holy Spirit. Last week we talked about uh, uh, the Holy Spirit. We began that series. Today we're going to continue. And I want to talk a little bit today about what does it mean. For the Holy Spirit to live within us. Amen? Because I think it's important that we understand what it means, why we need the Holy Spirit in our life. And last week we got a little, uh, kind of got a little just blunt and talked a little bit about tongues and people getting hung up on the tongues thing. And James chapter 3 is very clear with us that the tongue is the most unruly member of the body, right? And, and it makes perfect sense that God says, hey, whenever I can control the most uncontrollable part of you, that means I'm in control, right? And so we, we like to make this thing weird or strange, and, and we like to operate sometimes as believers on two-thirds of, of, of the Trinity, and God says, you know what, I've given you the Holy Spirit for a reason. Yeah. And so what does it mean for the Holy Spirit to live within us? There's a major change that happened between the Old Testament and the New Testament when it comes to how the Holy Spirit relates to people. How many are aware of that? I think most of us are, but some of us are kind of like, well, I'm aware of that, but I can't really explain it. But I want to, I'm going to here at the beginning, just read seven passages. And then after we read these seven passages, we're going to kind of be in Romans chapter seven and eight for the most of, most of our time this morning. But I want to kind of read a shotgun uh, uh, just throughout scripture here real quick. There's more than these, but I've kind of selected these few. I want to read first of all about the spirit in the Old Testament. In Judges chapter 6, verse 34, here's what it says. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, summoning the Abizrites to follow him. So what did the Spirit do? Came upon Gideon, right? If we look on to 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 12 and 13, this is the account of when Samuel was anointing David to be king, right? And here's what it says in 1 Samuel 16, 12, and 13. It says, so he sent for him and had him brought in. Samuel is sending for David and having David brought before him. And it says, David was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Don't know why we need to know that, but David was a good looking dude, right? 
Then the Lord said to Samuel, rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the spirit of the Lord, what? Came powerfully upon him. And then Samuel went to Ramah. In 2 Chronicles chapter 24 and verse 20, it says, Then the Spirit of God came on Zechariah, son of Jehode the priest. I'm not going to read the rest of the verse because the part I want to focus on is the Spirit of God came what? On. Say it again. On Zechariah. Let's look at the New Testament, the Spirit in the New Testament. John 14, 17 says this. The spirit of truth, that's another term for the Holy Spirit. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him or knows him, right? But you know him for he lives with you and will be in you, right? Now, what's, this is Jesus talking for the record in case you didn't know. When is Jesus going to be in them? We read it in Acts chapter 2, don't we? The Spirit was already with them, but he says he's going to be in you. We can continue on in the New Testament in Galatians, or I'm sorry, Romans chapter 8, verse 11. It says, and if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, let's read on. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Are you seeing a difference? Looking on in Galatians chapter 4 verse 6. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. Father. Or in other words, he's an intimate dad. One more New Testament passage in John chapter 7, verses 38 and 39. Jesus again speaking, he says, Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, has rivers of living water will flow from within them. But he goes on to say, By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. How many know the disciples, the followers, had the Spirit with them? But it says later, they're going to be filled or given to them in a different way. So I think it's pretty obvious the difference between the Old and the New Testament. The, the Spirit in the Old Testament came what? On people. The Spirit in the New Testament came in people. How many know those two words are pretty close? Two letter words both end with an N. And the first letter changes everything. One, he says, I'm going to come on you. After Jesus died and resurrected and sent the Holy Spirit, he says, now I'm going to live in you. So what does it mean for the Holy Spirit to live within us? And to answer the question of what the Holy Spirit does within us, I think it's helpful to ask another question. Do you ever feel stuck? I'm going to stand here and raise my hand until somebody else is honest. <laughs> Do we ever feel stuck? Absolutely. I think frequently in our lives we feel very stuck, as in you can't move past a certain point in your life Perhaps you're stuck at a particular job, at a particular salary, or you're stuck with a particular health condition that you just can't seem to move past, or maybe you're stuck in a particular sin that you just can't conquer. Some of you may be sitting in this room, and I'm not speculating or, or even have anyone in mind, but the reality is there's probably some of us just statistically in the room that you have struggled for years with the same sin in your life. You love Jesus. You asked him into your heart, but you're struggling with the same sin today that you were three years ago. And you feel stuck. Isn't that just honest though? Isn't that human nature, right? It's just real. It's, it's where we live. It's, it's the things that we face. 
Being stuck is well illustrated by a scene from a movie that's called The Boys Next Door, and it's a comedy, but it's about four lovable guys who live together in a group home. All four guys are mentally disabled, and one of the guys, Arnold, is a little bit stuck. And it goes like this. Arnold has gone to the grocery store and he comes back with nine boxes of Wheaties, seven heads of lettuce, and one bag of charcoal. Now, how those are related, we don't know. Arnold doesn't need all these groceries. So the guy who takes care of the four guys in the group home tells Arnold, he says, you've got to take those groceries back to the store and get your money back. Well, Arnold does. He's nervous, but he goes back to the store and he carries all of those things up to the register. And before he can tell the lady what he wants, she starts scanning them again and he pays for them a second time. And he takes them home. The gentleman at the house looks at him and says, you've got to take these groceries back. We don't need nine boxes of Wheaties, seven heads of lettuce and a bag of charcoal. Take it back. So he runs through it again and he gets the courage up to go back. And he goes back to the grocery store and he begins to go up to the cashier and the same thing happens. She begins to scan it. Beep, beep, you know how it goes. Fortunately for him, this time he's out of money. He can't pay for it, so they keep the items. He never gets his money back. He pays for it twice. He was kind of stuck. How many ever feel like that's a good scenario that defines your life? It's like, man, I am paying for the same thing over and over and over again. And I just feel stuck. See, we walk journeys we don't have to because we stay stuck when we don't have to stay stuck. We get stuck because we're like, I ask Jesus into my heart, check. I come to church every single Sunday, check. I pay my tithe, check. I do my best, check. And we never say, Holy Spirit, would you come? And we wonder why we get stuck day after day after day. When it comes to sin, we get stuck in habits of blowing up at people we should be gentle with. Perhaps you're stuck in the habit of jealousy or, or, or getting on an inappropriate website or, or, or perhaps you're stuck in unforgiveness and you're unable to move past it. I can look back at seasons in my life when I stood on a stage and I preached and I had this incredible thing of being stuck with anger and bitterness and it consumed me. I was mad at people that really had done very little to me but you know how we spin things whenever we just get stuck. And I never really allowed the Holy Spirit just to come in and heal my heart. So as we transition this morning to Romans, chapter 7 and 8 is where we're going to be. Paul gives us some levels in our fight against sin. And he's pretty clear it's, it's there in this passage, and I think sometimes we read these things and we miss the levels. But level one in your fight against sin is lust. Lust. When we hear lust, we always think in terms of sexual sin, and that's part of it, but I think it's a little more than that. Romans 7 and 8 describes these three levels in our fight against sin, and they're all stages which take place here on earth, because in heaven, how many know we'll be completely done with sin? For now, here we are fighting through these stages, and it's crucial to remember that as followers of Jesus Christ, we're meant to move forward. Disciples of Jesus were never meant to stay stuck. We were never meant to settle on one stage and just to kind of try to grit our way through it. Lust means to strongly desire something that is forbidden. And at this level, it's because you know you're not supposed to have something that it feels like something you'd like to have. In Romans 7, Paul describes God's law. You can think of it as the Ten Commandments, if you will, and say that it's because the law said not to do things that Paul said, I would like to try them. I mean, that's what Paul says. How many know that's not that different from us? 
Man, you tell a child, hey, don't put the fork in the socket. What do they want to do? Put the fork in the socket. We don't have to teach kids to disobey, but, but when the rules come, it, it begins this curiosity that says, I think I'd like to try the things I'm not supposed to try. <clears throat> in the book, in his writings called The Confessions, Augustine, theologian and philosopher, he confessed the sin of trespassing as a youth with his friends into a neighbor's yard and stealing the neighbor's pears. How many of a kid did something that horrible? <laughs> I can beat that, but we won't get into that. <clears throat> and at the time he was writing confessions, his guilt over this was what was significant. And we're thinking when we read stuff like that, Augustine, it's okay, man. It's no big deal. You were probably just hungry. But from Augustine's writing, his answer is basically, no, you don't understand. I wasn't hungry. And we would think, oh, well, it's just a pear, man. Let it go, right? It's not a big deal. But he says, actually, we didn't like them at all. We would just throw them at the pigs. And we're thinking, well, if you didn't like pears, then why in the world were you stealing them? And Augustine's reply, he says, that's the point. I didn't like pears. I liked stealing. I liked taking them. And his actual word says, it was foul and I loved it. I loved my own fault, not for that I was just faulty, but for the fault itself. You see, how do we find ourselves in this stage? Well, we meet God the Father, we recognize God exists, and we hear of all of his moral rules, and we chose to rebel. I think many times as God's people, we just see God's rules as weights that keep us from floating free. And I've heard people, non-believers, believers say this, who is he to tell me how to live? I've heard that phrase. Many, many times from people who walk through the doors of a church on a regular basis. Who is he to tell me how to live? When Paul wrote autobiographically his past feelings about God's rules and his own sin, things get a little dark in Romans chapter 7. <clears throat> Look at verse 5 with me, if you will. He says, For when we, when we were in the realm of the flesh... The sinful passions aroused by the law were at, work when, were at work in us so that we bore fruit for death. I don't think it's a mystery that we have a sinful nature. It is much easier to do wrong than it is to do right. Amen? It's much easier to hang on to things that God wants us to let go of <clears throat> than it is to give it to him. But then he continues on in Romans chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. Listen to this verse. What shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. So Paul is basically saying that when we, when we come to grips that there's a God, that there's this moral creator, that if there's a God, how many know there's moral absolutes? And he gets to make the rules. And when we come to that conclusion, it's the fact that he says, Coveting is not okay. Being jealous is not okay. Being greedy is not okay. That those things begin to spring to life in us because there becomes an awareness. I've got things in my life that the absolute creator and the definition of morality says I shouldn't have in my life. And that's what Paul is saying. It brings us an awareness of the sin which takes us to level two in our fight against sin, and that's disgust. So how do we move past the stage of wanting something because we're not supposed to have it? We move past that stage of lust by meeting someone else. We had met God the Father, and we felt like rebelling, 
And yet after meeting this new person, rebelling loses a little bit of its thrill, doesn't it? And who is it we meet? Well, God the Son, Jesus. Now when you sin, you're not happy about it and you begin to get disgusted by it. Why? Because we see that our sin costs Jesus his life. And even in scripture, we see that Paul goes from this whole thing about lust to disgust and we're gonna read it in just a moment. But now when you sin, you realize I'm hurting the person who gave his life for me. I'm not just rebelling against a strict father, but I'm hurting a friend. You're betraying Jesus who has gone to all of the, the pain and the sacrifice and living on this earth sinful or sinlessly so that we can have life abundant. And so when we begin to sin, now we are faced with guilt and disgust. When Paul described the stage of lust that we read about, it was past tense. He says, sin produced in me every kind of coveting in Romans 7, 8. But when Paul described his own disgust toward his sin, he switches to the present tense. It's an ongoing battle, isn't it? But here's what it says in Romans 7, 15 through 20. I do not understand what I do. <laughs> Anybody there? For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. How do you feel about that one? This is the Apostle Paul who wrote a third of the New Testament or more. Saying, I want to do good, but I can't carry it out. I don't know about you, but it gives me hope that in my struggles that God can still use us. Amen. He says, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. How many are confused? <laughs> Quick summary. Paul says, man, I want to do what's right. I want to live for Jesus. I want to live for the Lord, but man, I always mess it up. Anybody relate? The things I want to do, the things I know that are good, that I should do, I end up doing the opposite. And the things that I don't want to do that I know are wrong, I end up doing them anyway. And he's saying, you know what? I now have transitioned from desiring to do those bad things and, and rebelling against a strict father to I'm disgusted by myself when I fail. Why? Because he's met Jesus, the Son of God. In this stage, Paul is speaking as a Christian. He's speaking of a follow, as a follower of Christ, and he feels this disgust. And can I just say this today? Many believers get stuck right here. And we live in this cycle of sin, disgust, repent. Sin, disgust, repent. Sin, disgust, repent. And depending on the experience you have with the Lord, that, that repentance time may last days, it may last weeks, it may last months, and then, but then you go back to it. Am I the only one, or, or can you guys relate? This is the cycle Paul's talking about. I've walked it, I've lived it, I've journeyed it. But then he continues on and he says, but there's more. And level three in our fight against sin is trust. See, we don't have to stay in lust. Why? Because we meet God the Son and we begin to hate our sin. So is there a path that leads us out of consistently doing what we hate, who can lead us out of that stage of sin and disgust and repentance and repeating it over and over and over? Yes, there's a way out and here's how we meet someone else. We meet the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, verses 37 and 38, 
It says this, and it says, and, and, and I want you to understand, this is Peter speaking now. And we're reading about the disciple who just a short time earlier had completely failed, denied Christ, right, to save his own skin, and now he's preaching in front of thousands after being filled with the Holy Spirit farther up in Acts chapter 2. Here's what he says. It says, when the people heard this, his message about repenting, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Many believers, here's where we stop. I want to read verse 38 again. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. The end. I asked Jesus into my heart. I got baptized in water. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's with me. I'm good. But then your journey looks like sin, disgust, repent, sin, disgust, repent. How many know Peter's journey prior to Acts chapter 2 looked like sin, disgust, repent? Even to the point where Jesus looks at him and says, get behind me, Satan. I'm sure that made Peter feel really good. Right? Peter ran his mouth and, and was a little bit spontaneous and, and would just say whatever came to his mind. And, and it was oftentimes inappropriate but when he got the Holy Spirit, his cycle changed. And the thing I love about this is, is instead of stopping it, repent and be baptized, he says, and you, didn't say may, didn't say it's available if you want it. He says, and you will. How I many that's a definitive? Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now let's keep in mind today because some of you are like, well, you get the Holy Spirit when you're saved. Yes, you do. We read it in John 14. He is with you, but he wants to be in you. And when we read Acts chapter two, this is coming off of the experience when people were standing around hearing 120 in the upper room speaking a different language and some of them were like, how do these people know my language? The Lord was using it in a powerful way. So the context of this is you will be filled with the Holy Spirit and you will speak in tongues. That's the context, right? I'm not making this up. And so I want you to understand today that, that, that the, according to Scripture, the progression is, I ask Jesus Christ into my heart. Forgive us of my sins. Right? Baptism is, is, a, is a next step. And he says, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. It is expected, biblically, as followers of Christ, that we're filled with the Holy Spirit. It's expected. It's not some extreme thing. It's not some extreme uh, relational thing. It's expected that we're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. He says, you will be. Well, we can reject it. And we can say, no, thank you. I don't want to have anything to do with that. But if you do that, I want you to understand that the likelihood of the cycle, sin, disgust, repent, becomes a lot more likely in your life when you reject the fullness of what he's done for you. Amen? Therefore, the Christian, for us, it's no longer just me versus sin anymore, and that's a good thing, because the verses in Romans, in which Paul describes his stage of disgust, we read it in Romans 15 and 19, especially it talks about the disgust, but the words I or me in the, the Romans 7 that passage is said 30 times. Paul's like, when I depend on I, when I depend on me, man, it's just an endless cycle. Read through there. Let me, let me just go back real quick. Romans 7, 15 through 20. 
and I'm not going to read all of it, but let's just read verse 15 and 19. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. How many eyes? It's a lot of eyes, isn't it? For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. That's just two verses. When you're just depending on yourself, when you're depending on your own grit and your own determination to be faithful and to serve God faithfully, can I just tell you, it's a losing battle. For me and you, all of us, it's a losing battle. But here's something I want you to understand. And I think this is awesome. If you don't hear anything else today, hear this. I'm getting ready to close. In Romans chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, we're going to read it in a moment. But when we meet God, there's that awakening of, you know, like, here's the law. It's hard to keep it. And it brings sometimes that lust of, of things that are forbidden in our life. And then we meet Jesus, and we go to disgust, and then we meet the Holy Spirit, and there's trust. But something happens when you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at Romans 8, 14 through 17. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in the sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. When the Holy Spirit fills you, how many know that definition of the Father sounds very different than the previous one we read where it's about rules and a strict father? When we get filled with the Holy Spirit, the way we see the Father completely changes. Because in Romans chapter 8, he makes it very clear that all of a sudden, we cry out to him as though it's, Daddy, you love me. I know that you care for me. I can sense your love. I know that you're real, that you've got a good plan for my life. And now, when I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, it's not just about following rules. It's, I have a Father who loves me. We talked about it last week in John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Jesus didn't love us less than the Father, so because Jesus loves us as much as the Father, he says, I want to give you the Holy Spirit. Dad gave you me, I'm giving you the Holy Spirit. And when we get the Holy Spirit, we have this depth of relationship with the Father where we begin to understand that he's a good, good Father and that he loves us, and he has good things for you, and it's no longer about obeying rules because you've got to be good. It's about saying, I want to please the Father in heaven because he loves me. And there's some of you in this room today that you're like, man, I cannot even begin to imagine the concept of a good dad because my dad did da, 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 da. I'm sorry, but you've got to understand that the attributes of a failed human father are not attributed to the perfect father in heaven yes. who loves you. And he just wants us to know him intimately. And it's through his spirit that we get to know him in that way. The spirit reminds us that we're no longer condemned. Romans 8, 1 says this, therefore there is now, Paul says this, there is now because of no longer the disgust and we're filled with the spirit. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We don't have to feel disgusted. We don't have to feel condemned. We feel that we, we're loved by the Father. In Romans 8, 6, it says, The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Man, when you're filled with the Spirit, 
You can fail. Uh, listen, I want you to hear this. I'm not saying if you feel the Spirit, you never, you never sin or fail, right? We're imperfect human beings. But when you're filled with the Spirit, there's just this awareness that, man, I failed. I did the things I don't want to do, but the Father loves me. And I'm sorry for what I did but I can still walk forward in life and in peace and in grace and forgiveness because I'm not following a strict father who has rules just because there's rules. I'm following a father who loves me. One last verse in Romans 8, 26. says, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. He helps us in our weakness, the Holy Spirit intercedes for us. And it's powerful stuff, guys. Why would we want to try to follow Christ and say, well, I got the Father, I got the Son, I really don't need the Holy Spirit part. Man, why would we want to fight that battle on our own and live in a cycle where we're constantly disgusted or frustrated? And God has fullness for us and grace and mercy. Just a quick story. and don't know if it's a true story or not, but I've heard people tell it as though it's true, but sometimes people make that stuff up. There's a man who had a daughter, and he gives his daughter a necklace of, of fake pearls when she's a little bitty girl, and this necklace becomes her favorite thing. She played with it, wore it all the time, would do it for dress up as she was a little girl. And she gets a little older and the daddy does something that seems like something a good dad should not do. And he asks her, he says, do you love me? And she says, well, dad, of course I love you. And he says, well, can you give me that pearl necklace? And she says, no, dad, this is my favorite thing. He says, you can have any other toy you want, but not the necklace. He says, okay. A few days later, he comes to her again with the same request. He says, do you love me? She says, yes, dad, I love you. He said, well, can I have your necklace of pearls? And this time she, with a tear in her eye, says, yes, dad, you can have it. And she hands over her necklace of fake pearls. And at that moment, the dad takes from behind his back a box and hands it to her, and it's real pearls. And she's now old enough to, to wear those. Here's the deal. As we grow in the Holy Spirit, you're going to have habits that God is going to say, will you give that to me? Will you give that to me? Problem is many times like, no, 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 no. I need that. Man, I like that. It's one of my favorite things. It helps me cope. It helps me deal. The Father says, okay. He'll come back later and say, do you love me? I'm like, yes, Jesus. Yes, God. I love you. Will you give me that? Here's the thing we got to understand. Is when he puts his hand out, whatever we're willing to put in his hand is not as good as what he has in the other hand that he wants to give you in return. Yes. And we spend our life settling for second-rate gifts from God because we're not willing to give up the things that hinder our walk with him. I mean, no, there are things that are not sin that can still hinder our walk. Let's be honest. So, now, there are some things that are sin that totally do, but there are things that are not sin in and of themselves, but they're a misplaced priority, and the Holy Spirit begins speaking, and he says, will you give me that? And if you will, he has something better for you, something much better for you. Can we trust him? Yeah. Question is, Will you trust him? Let's stand this morning. Bow your heads with me if you would. Lord, we just thank you for your goodness, for your faithfulness, for your spirit, Lord. The God you sent your son, Jesus. And we know that you sent your spirit, Lord, as he ascended to heaven, Lord, that God you sent your spirit. And we know that you did that, that we might have life, life abundant, life to the full. And today that we would not be content to just say, 
I'm checking boxes. I've asked Jesus into my heart. But that God, we would say, Lord, I want everything you have for me. I want your Holy Spirit. I want you to lead me. I want you to live in me, not just be with me, but I want to be filled with you. God, that's our heart this morning. We just ask right now that you would just guide us and direct us. Lead these moments, God, and that we would respond to your presence in complete obedience, Lord. We give you all the praise. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. With their heads bowed and eyes closed this morning for just a moment, nobody looking around. But I want to ask a couple things. First of all, you'd say, you know what, I, I, I'm here this morning and I don't know Jesus as my personal Savior. There's a lot of scenarios we can paint. Maybe you've never asked him into your heart. Maybe you have and you've kind of walked away from that commitment and the Lord is calling you back today. I don't know. But the bottom line is you, you're here and you'd say, I don't know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. But I know that he's speaking to my heart. And I know that I need to ask him to come into my heart again, fresh and new, or maybe for the first time. If that's you this morning, I want to just ask you if you would, just quick enough so I can see it, nobody looking around, would you just slip up your hand, put it right back down, anyone this morning before we pray. Thank you for that one. Anyone else? Anyone else? You'd say, man, I, I, I want a real, intimate relationship with the Father. Anyone else before we pray? Amen. Ask is this. As you'd say, I, I need the Holy Spirit. I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I want to encourage you in something today. Don't worry about what it's going to look like, feel like. God has all that in control. All we do is humbly come to him and say, God, I need your spirit. Just ask him. The Bible says it's a gift, and he wants to freely give to you. And so would you just say, I need the Holy Spirit in my life. I need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Would you slip up your hand this morning? Amen. Thank you for that one. Thank you. Thank you. Any others? Thank you. I see that one. And you know, once we're filled, God wants to keep us filled. Amen? It's a daily relationship where he wants to fill us on a daily basis. I want to ask if our prayer team would come forward this morning. Listen, there is nothing necessarily hyper-spiritual about this space up here. It's just a group of people who say, we want to pray with you, we want to agree with you. And we trust that God's going to do the rest. Amen? And this morning, if you slipped up your hand, just want to ask you to take one more bold step of faith. We're not going to embarrass you, ask you a lot of questions. We just want to pray with you. If you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we're going to pray and ask God to fill you. There is no magic prayer. We're just trusting God to do what he says he will do to give you the gift that he wants to give you. All we have to do is receive. Amen? So as we worship this morning as Amy leads. If you slipped up your hand, and if you didn't and you need to be up here, would you come and allow us to pray with you? Let's do that this morning. Let's worship. Would you come as Amy leads us? Oh, I've heard a thousand stories of what they think you're like and I've heard a tender whisper of love in the dead of night and you tell me that you're pleased and that I'm never alone. You're a good, good father. It's 
us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Jesus. Amen. I want to encourage you just in something before we leave. And if you desire to be filled with the Spirit, don't overcomplicate it. Ask Him. You know, I think back to one of the most in, in, in my life going back. I was in a room, there was a lot of people there, but I just stood here like this and not telling you to do this. I'm just giving you the simplicity of it. And I just prayed and I said, Holy Spirit, come. And it was in a season of life where I was pretty dry. It had been a long time. And he just began to flood my spirit, my heart. And it's that simple. Just ask them. It can happen in your home. It can happen in church. It can happen anywhere and everywhere. If it happens in your car, that's fine. Keep your eyes open if you're driving. <laughs> Amen? But don't complicate it. In Acts chapter 2, and I'm just going to read one thing, and it's at the very beginning of, of the chapter, verses 1 and through 4, but it says in Acts chapter 2, we know that's the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit fell on the 120 in the upper room. It said, all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. All of them. And began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. There's this element in there that as they were being filled with the Holy Spirit, they had to take the step of faith and speak what the Lord had put there. Some of you may be like, well, you know, I'm just waiting for this. If you're waiting for this magical moment where the Holy Spirit comes and just absolutely grabs you and starts shaking your tongue, that's not. He will put it there, but it's an exercise of faith to speak what he gives you. And I love that. The Bible says that the gifts are subject to us. And there's a humility that comes with saying, okay, Father, I will submit to what I do not understand. Amen? Amen? That's good. Yep. God loves us. And he wants to re restore no matter what you've done. Amen? No matter where we've been. And some of us, you haven't been in a bad place. Good for you. That's great. You still need the Holy Spirit. Amen? But let's simplify. Man, it's, it's just Acts 2, 37, 38. Peter says, and you will be filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen? Just Holy Spirit, come. Ask him to fill you. It's not mysterious. It's no formula. It's just trusting him. Amen? Walking in the fullness of what he has for you. Amen?
Amen. We're going to pray. Ask for the Lord's blessing as we go. Uh, Wednesday night, uh, we're going to pray this week, um, um, just most of the time. And um, So come 6, uh, six o'clock, and we're going to um, be praying and seeking the Lord. Have a little time in the Word, possibly, but just going to let the Holy Spirit really lead our evening. Um, but let's pray. Ask the Lord's blessing as we go. God, we just thank you again for your goodness. God, that you have good things for us, Lord. Let us just learn to trust you, Lord. That, God, whatever you have for us, God, we want it. And, Lord, that you would bless us and anoint us as we go. God, that we would walk in the fullness of who you are. God, that we would trust you, Lord, with every step, every moment. And, God, that we may even just very simply just say, Jesus, Holy Spirit, just come. Fill us, we pray, Lord. God, we need you. We need God the Father. We need God the Son. We need God the Holy Spirit. We need all three, Lord. God, that we might live the victorious life that you paid for us to live. We ask these things, Lord. Help us to be an influence everywhere we go, Lord, to love others and to do it well. We ask for your blessings, your provision upon us, Lord. And bring us back ready to worship Wednesday night, Lord. We thank you for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. God bless you. Have a great week. See you Wednesday night, 6 o'clock.